Moving swiftly on, the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14730 in the name of Gil Patterson on Children's Grief Awareness Week. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I'd invite all members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I now call on Mr Patterson to open this debate. Mr Patterson, you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Uh, Presiding officer, many thanks for that. Can I first take the opportunity to thank members uh, for providing support for this motion and allowing for this debate to take place uh, this evening. It's an important uh, evening uh, for it to take place. I would also like to welcome members from the Scottish Court Death Trust and uh, the Richmond Hope, the UK Sands, the Muslim Bereavement Support Services, Child Bereavement UK, Seasons for Growth, Petal Support, Sands Lothians, parents who were affected, and Wilma Carruther, um, who are all in the gallery uh, tonight. Um, and if I've missed anyone, I must apologise. There may well be people that I don't know are here tonight. I, I want to use most of my words, uh, but not exclusively, uh, as you will hear, on some of the recent aspects of the good work done by the Scottish Court Death Trust. Presiding officer, one in 29 children in the UK today have been bereaved of a parent, brother or a sister. And today marks the last day of the week-long Children's Grievance uh, Awareness Week, uh, I, which allowed all of us uh, to come together to show our support for bereaved children. When a child dies, most of the focus is usually on the adults compared to the siblings. It is recognised that children react to loss differently. However, regardless of this, children require support also in order for them to adjust, to change and to understand what has happened. Families who, have, who use services of the Scottish Court Death Trust are often worried about how their children are going to cope and when uh, in this position, uh, they need to know and the, uh, that the parents need to know uh, themselves uh, and they worry about the children uh, rather than their own grief. The Scottish Court Death Trust offers a valuable home visiting bereavement support service that enables them to meet uh, the parents and children together. For more specialist support for children, referrals can be made to play therapy uh, and for a uh, filial uh, therapy where parents are taught how to offer support to their children through structured play. Often referrals are made to specific support uh, available in a children's home area, which is tailored to their age, and as such, the Trust works collaboratively with a number of other organisations to make this possible, including Seasons of, for Growth, Richmond Hope, Winston's, uh, Winston's Wish, Child Bereavement UK and Simba Charity. The services offered by the Trust and all organisations involved are not only vital to the children and families who re receive them, but also to ensure the widest support is available. And I know that Richmond Hope, who are based in Edinburgh, are about to open a centre in Glasgow, which is very welcome news indeed. And if I can, say, if I can digress just a little, it, it would seem to me that since there are so many organisations doing this sterling work, perhaps it might be worthwhile for the Parliament to consider a strategy to enhance further, further the great working practices within this vital sector. Presiding officer, it is well known that adults find addressing and explaining the topic of death when it happens daunting, but it is made even harder when it is a sibling of a child and they themselves are still grieving. The introduction, the introduction of two particular resources, which I am very proud to be highlighting here this evening, not only helps adults to approach discussing death with a child, but also to help children who are born into a family who have lost a child. The first of these resources is Rory Star. And Rory Star, for me, is like a book that you would pick up in a nursery or in a school, and it's so well illustrated. 
and easy read, I'm sure, by uh, children. When this book was produced, there was no other resource available in Scotland for young children when a baby died from cot death. The book, aimed at children, tells the story of a young girl who has just began to get used to, the, to having a little bro brother when he passes away. It deals with witnessing grief during this time and attending funeral. It reassures children that it is okay to cry about the loss of their brother or sister. For grieving parents who must struggle to come to terms with sudden death of their child, while still being a good mum or dad to the children and remain the, res to, and remain, the source is an invaluable uh, one indeed. Money was raised by a mum, a Wil Wilman Carricker, whose son Andrew passed away in 1990 from cot death, aged 16 weeks. The Trust invested the money in creating the resource. The second book called Andrew's Rainbow, and here we are again, it's in the same type of vein, it's made for children, is so beautifully illustrated like the first one. It was following the launch of Rory Star that Wilma became aware of a gap in sibling support for children born into a family after the death of a child. It is so important that these children, often called rainbow babies, are supported any in any grief that they feel towards the brother or sister they knew. There will be photographs of their siblings and other family members and important days in, in, in the year that are shared by the family to remember their brother or sister. They will form a bond with their sibling through the family talking about memories and looking at photographs. For them, it is important that they know they are not a replacement for the child who had died. Some may wonder whether they would be born if, there was a, if their sibling was, had not passed. The idea is that the baby is like a rainbow after a storm. Rainbow babies is the understanding that a beauty, the beauty of a rainbow does not negate the ravages of the storm. When a rainbow appears, it doesn't mean the storm never happened or that the family is not still dealing with its aftermath. What it means is that something beautiful and, and full of light has appeared in the midst of the darkness and clouds. Storm clouds may never hover, but the rainbow provides a counterbalance of colour, energy and hope. For young children having an older sibling who only appears as a baby in a photograph is a complex situation. They, they, they may tell people they have an older sibling or include the sibling in activities such as drawing family trees. They may wonder what their older brother or sister would look like. Would they look like? Would they look alike? Would they share the same interests? The book Andrew's Rainbow contains the actual words of rainbow children and, have, and was written to help both parents and professionals explore some of the feelings children have about, their, 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 uh, about being born into a family after a loss of a sibling. The book I have highlighted, the books I have highlighted is what, what prompted me to bring this debate to Parliament and I sincerely hope that this debate will assist in promoting the support and resources available to children as well as acknowledging the work of all organisations involved in, in, in highlighting the importance of supporting children as well as adults through bereavement. And finally, commends the work of all the organisations engaged in this difficult work, but of um, immense importance to us all. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kenny McCaskill. Four minutes or thereby, so please. I congratulate um, 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 Gil Patterson for bringing forward this debate and welcome all the uh, different groups uh, to the gallery. I, I only looked into the two that are mentioned uh, in the motion, uh, Grief Encounter and the Scottish Cot Death Trust, although uh, I'd also like to thank the Childhood Bereavement Network and Marie Curie for their very useful briefings for this debate. I suppose um, most people might say that all deaths are equal, but it, but it always seems to me that the most terrible deaths are when, on the one hand, 
a parent loses a, a child, uh, or on the other hand, when a child loses uh, a parent. And the Scottish Cot Death Trust, of course, um, are perhaps best known for the public in terms of the grief that parents feel when they lose a child. And um, we're told that uh, a baby dies still every nine days of cot death in Scotland. So that is absolutely uh, awful, a devastating experience for parents. But what the motion uh, emphasises today that it can also be uh, a, a, a heart-rending uh, experience for the sibling of the child who has died. Um, and I suppose we can um, imagine that if we think of having to explain this sudden absence uh, of a new life to a confused uh, sibling. And, and that really is uh, what the books that um, Gil Patterson has described uh, have been seeking to do, an honest and heartfelt way of, of explaining some of the most profound and difficult questions a child can ask in such a situation. So more generally, the Trust, of course, seeks to support families but also to educate the public and professionals about how to re reduce the risk of court death. So I pay tribute to their work. The Childhood uh, Bereavement Network, in their briefing, um, emphasised uh, how children need support in grief and also point out the long term as well as the immediate consequences if we fail to do it. And that's something that we have to uh, bear in mind. They also remind us about how many uh, children are affected by this in Scotland is each year and say that 5% um, of uh, children have been bereaved of at least one parent by the age of 16. They also emphasise the importance of schools and having sensible and flexible people and systems to provide support and that connects with one of the two recommendations from Marie Curie. They're recommending that it should be built into the curriculum for excellence in terms of awareness of grief and bereavement for all uh, in school and they also make the recommendation uh, that there should be a natural, national coordinator for childhood bereavement in Scotland so I hope the government will reflect on those suggestions. Now the other um, organisation mentioned in the uh, motion is Grief Encounter who also work incredibly hard to help children grapple with loss and death and support the family uh, as a whole in such a situation. They also aim to work closely with professionals within the sector, providing training to counsellors, uh, those who give counsellors with an F, I should say, uh, teachers uh, and company employees and who will work closely with uh, uh, children who have experienced uh, loss. Now, they also, as the motion uh, reminds us, organise Grief Awareness Week, which I think started on the 19th of November, and it was very moving to read of the ca candle ceremony that commences the week's uh, event, really a very poignant way of remembering uh, loved ones who have been lost. And the theme this year is supporting parents and carers, supporting grieving children. Uh, Grief Encounter also uh, run a helpline which currently supports over 300 people uh, annually. So, in conclusion, I would like to pay tribute to their work, the work of the Scottish Cot Death Trust, and the work of all the organisations in the gallery and those who are not here today as well who work in this uh, very important uh, field. Many thanks. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Nanette Milne. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, too, uh, join in uh, thanking Gil Patterson for raising this issue and, indeed, for his eloquent uh, speech that narrated the depth and the complexity of the issue. It isn't high profile, but it's certainly high in its consequence and its effect and, indeed, in its intensity for many. But I think, as we all are aware, it's hidden in many ways, and it's hidden for perhaps two reasons. First of all, because of age. It can be hidden because of the inability for a child to communicate, or because perhaps the reticence and the lack of maturity and the inability to verbalise or speak to others. Uh, and indeed, that's compounded by the inability of adults perhaps to address the needs of the child, perhaps are concerned with their own grief in some instances, or it's just difficult. Uh, and those are challenges that multiply the problems that affects everybody uh, when there's a loss. But it's also a culture in Scotland. We do have a culture of big boys don't cry. And even girls sometimes are expected just to soak it up and get on with it. Uh, not just Scotland, but the Western world. It's not particularly good at dealing with death. And I think it's probably been compounded over recent years. But it's something that we've passed down through the generations. 
and the older generation who should be able to address it better uh, are not particularly good in helping those who are younger and struggling to cope with it. It is significant, the statistics that came out in the briefing that uh, Malcolm Chisholm referred to from the Child Bereavement Network are substantial. 2,400 parents uh, died in Scotland, leaving dependent children just last year. 3,900 newly bereaved children last year. Around 3.5% of school-aged children and young people between 5 and 16 have been bereaved at some point, and indeed 5% of young people have been bereaved of at least one parent by the time they reach the age of 16. They go on to narrate the outcomes in terms of health, mental and physical, in terms of effect upon education and employment, and indeed it also says sadly criminal and disruptive behaviour because the death of a parent by the age of 26 increases the risk of a criminal conviction for a violent offence, and the statistics here are rather stark. And I do recall, as the Justice Secretary, challenging the prison service about the uh, difficulties that we have with women offenders who are treated very sympathetically for the loss and trauma that they've often gone through, and asking them about the comparisons with young men, to which they said, well, often the same difficulties applied with young men, but that culture I referred to of big boys not crying, simply soaking it up, transcends themselves in it not being addressed, never being articulated, but having lifelong consequences that sadly has seen them get into poem at young offenders or indeed the adult prison network. That's not to condone the behaviour that they've done. They do have to address it and face the consequences of their actions. But we do try and require to tackle the underlying effects and manifestations of it, because sadly, so often, what they will have been doing is trying to address their bereavement and loss by that traditional Scottish method of self-medication through alcohol or drugs, and that's why we require to address it. We are blessed in Scotland by the agencies that Gil Patterson narrated. Uh, I'm glad to see Richmond Hope, who are in my constituency, who I've visited. I'm delighted to hear that they're extending their services elsewhere. They do face challenges in the resources that they have. Uh, a few people do an awful lot of good work uh, with a, a large number of young people. We do have to have a strategy, but we do have to have delivery. We are in tight and straitened circumstances, probably compounded by what's been happening in another parliament elsewhere today. But I would ask the Minister to ensure that not only do we have that strategy, but we do what we can to ensure that we have that resource for these outstanding organisations that Gil Patterson narrated that are necessary for every individual and especially for every child who's suffered loss. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Annette Milne, after which we move the closing speech to the Minister. I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate and thank Gil Patterson on securing a debate on his motion this evening. We have seen many members' debates in this Parliament on various awareness weeks, and I feel it is particularly important that an issue such as children's grief is recognised here. This week exists to highlight the challenges faced by children affected by bereavement, and these children, wherever they are in the country, should have access to support services to help them to cope and rebuild their lives. I note that this year the week is coordinated with Grief Encounter, a charity established in 2003 which provides grief services uh, to support bereaved children and their families. I am pleased we have the opportunity to discuss this important issue on the very last day of this Awareness Week, and I understand a number of activities have taken place across the UK since the 19th of November, including promoting awareness on social media, such as their thunderclap, which reached over 850,000 people and encouraging supporters to organise events, including training days and workshops for families. The statistics on how many children and young people face this challenge are eye-opening. Grief Encounter says that 1 in 29 children under the age of 16 in the UK will suffer the death of a parent. In the briefing paper by the Childhood Bereavement Network, they suggest that up to 2,400 parents with dependent children died in Scotland last year. However, these are estimates because they point out that there is not official data collected, which they argue makes service development even more challenging. The outcomes of bereavement of a close relative or friend to children and young people can be both immediate and longer term. When, when children experience such a sad loss, they will experience a range of emotions. They may be concerned and confused and overwhelmed by all that is going on around them. Even if a child has helped through this difficult period, the effects of such a profound loss can impact on their education later on. 
My nephew and niece lost their mum when they were children. My niece gave way to her emotions quickly and recovered well. My nephew didn't, and I'm not sure he's ever fully recovered from his loss. The Childhood Bereavement Network has research showing that compared to their non-bereaved peers, children who have lost a parent are more likely to suffer from a mental disorder, 1.7 times more likely to attempt suicide in young adulthood, and 50% more likely to die before middle age. With regards to children's education, the network notes that bereaved children can score half a grade lower in G GCSE exams, and for girls bereaved of a sibling, this can be a full grade. The death of a parent before age 16 is found to increase the chances of the bereaved child being unemployed by age 30. These statistics are truly shocking and show the need for awareness of this issue. In my own region, we have the highly regarded Grampian Child Bereavement Network, which works to assist children and young people to access appropriate support, uh, the, uh, appropriate support they need to cope with bereavement. One of their resources is a book called Muddles, Puddles and Sunshine, which offers invaluable practical and sensitive support for younger bereaved children. The book offers a structure and an outlook uh, for the many difficult feelings which inevitably follow a loss. It aims to help children make sense of their experience and reflect on their grief, and to find a balance between remembering the person who has passed away and having fun. Presiding officer, society must become more open to discussion of bereavement, and one area which has only received limited consideration is the area of pre-bereavement. In many cases, when a parent knows they're going to die, the stress of not knowing what will happen can affect the child. NHS Choices has developed an information service for children which encourages parents to talk about their impending death and has suggested that parents start a memory box to give children the opportunity to keep things which remind them of their time together. This can also be done with other family members after the parent dies. I also welcome the work of the Scottish Scott Death Trust. It's perhaps impossible for any parents and families who have not lived through it to understand the grief experienced following the loss of a child or a baby. Having come close to losing my own son when he'd liver failure age 20, I often wonder just how I and my family would have coped had his liver transplant not been available or successful. So I cannot begin to imagine how people can cope with the sudden death of a healthy baby, and I'm so thankful for the work done by the Cot Death Trust to help parents and children in this situation. So in closing, presiding officer, can I ask the minister to take on board uh, the need to include bereavement as part of teacher and staff support staff training? This would fit with recent legislation to widen the scope of teachers and classroom support staff to meet the emotional and diverse needs of pupils. And finally, congratulations to all the charities who work in this area and again to the member for securing this debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will call on Minister Aileen Campbell to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government Ministry of Seven Minutes or thereby, please. Um, thank you, uh, President Officer, and I'd also like to put on record my thanks to Gil Patterson uh, for raising this important issue. Uh, and like Gil, I uh, also extend my thanks uh, and welcome to all the groups here tonight in, in the public gallery. This debate has provided a very valuable opportunity to highlight Children's Grief Awareness Week, organised by the charity Grief uh, Encounter, and more widely, though, to put on record uh, our thanks for the excellent work being done across a range of different organisations and settings to provide what I think we all recognise as much-needed support to those, including children, who have suffered from uh, a bereavement. And bereavement is, of course, traumatic for anyone at any stage. I think a point recognised by, uh, by Malcolm Chisholm, but it's particularly traumatic when that loss comes in early life. And as Gil Patterson said, the statistics are stark. One in 29 children in the UK have lost a parent or sibling. And given the number of children and young people who are affected and given the impact that loss can have on them, it is crucial we provide free, professional, compassionate support at a time when children are vulnerable. And it's in that context of support that I want to mention getting it right for every child. Because within that approach, that GERFEC approach, the name person rule will be made available to children and young people across Scotland from August 2016, following the passage of the Children and Young People Act last year. The name person has a role to promote, support and safeguard the well-being of children and young people. And I have no doubt that the pain described tonight will be 
will be a, a useful, this will be a useful kind of a, a mechanism by which people can find that support that they need. Because families may well use the name person for issues which are affecting their child's well-being, such as separation, loss or bereavement. And that name person structure, that getting it right for every child approach, will be hopefully, I think, a, 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 a structure by which we can signpost children and, young, and families onto groups with specialisms that are able to help and that we can take on board the points raised through the briefings that I think have been circulated for tonight's uh, debate and also the points raised around what we need to do around curriculum for excellence and to better recognise in a national sense the need to coordinate support for families and children at this uh, vulnerable time. Now, I recently spoke with a constituent's niece, Dr Rachel Fearnley, who has done academic research on uh, the topic of bereavement. And she certainly described to me some of the areas that she believed we needed to uh, concentrate on uh, within the context of grieving. She described that for some, the pre-death period, there is a gap in support, and that for some, it's only post-bereavement where help kicks in. I think that's a point that's been recognised and raised by Nanette Milne. Her study also described that children are impacted by bereavement may suffer a social death, whereby their cubs, their scouts, their sporting events that they used to attend to may end while focus is on the family member who is ill. And she also described to me about the need to look at adolescents who may find their own coping strategies and that uh, if effective intervention isn't there, that that may well lead to uh, criminal or negative behaviour. And I think that's a point that Kenny McCaskill was also raising, that we need to make sure that the way in which young uh, adolescents are coping with these things isn't through the self-medication or isn't through uh, negative uh, behaviour. So we need to make sure that we're acting early to help those young people, uh, vulnerable young people, avoid that route. Gil Patterson and Mal Malcolm Chisholm also described the trauma, pain and hurt of children who suffer bereavement and the books mentioned by Gill that go some way to support the family. Uh, and his and others' comments about the, the pain felt by siblings who lose a brother or a sister reminds me of hearing uh, a, a, an event uh, organised by Youth Cancer Trust about hearing a brother speak about losing his sister to cancer who described feelings of sadness, of anger, but also feeling quite jealous that the focus was always on the sister. And that complex, complex wrangling of emotions that he had to go through it showcased to me, I think, very eloquently the real need that we have to provide that emotion support to help these young people cope with the trauma that they're going through. And that's why, as well as the legislative provisions that I've mentioned through the Children and Young People Act, that the Scottish Government also provides funding to a number of organisations who support families at a time of loss. And those organisations include Child Bereavement UK, Cruise Bereavement Care Scotland, CHAS, and the Children's Hospice Association of Scotland. And that for that reason, that's why we need to make sure that that support continues and we continue to support to provide the support to those organisations that are well placed and understand the uh, complexity of the issue that we're here to debate tonight. Now, the motion that Gil Patterson has for debate focuses not just on the impact of a child losing a loved one, but also on the loss of a child and notes the valuable work of the Scottish Caught Death Trust. Uh, and I also recognise that miscarriage or stillbirth can also have a huge effect on a family and there are a number of measures in place to help health boards provide appropriate training to enable doctors and midwives to, to support parents at that vulnerable time. And through the work of the Early Years Collaborative and the Maternity and Children Quality Improvement Collaborative, we are also supporting practitioners to deliver improvements in those services. Both collaboratives aim to reduce the rate of stillbirth and a wide range of work has already been uh, taken uh, to help. For example, increasing the uptake of Healthy Start vouchers, joining up midwifery and addiction services for vulnerable families and supporting pregnant women to stop smoking. And we've seen a positive downward trend in the rates of stillbirth. So I would also at that point like to mention the work of SANS, eh, a charity which undertakes work throughout Scotland in working with health professionals to improve the quality of care and services provided to bereaved parents and their families. Now, the Scottish Government currently provides the organisation with financial support to help continue this valuable work and to also work with health boards to ensure that relevant staff receive appropriate education and training to support parents at this vulnerable time. But I think a clear message from this debate to tonight is also that we need to make sure that that training and support isn't just there for the professionals that work in the health sector, but making sure that that is there also for those uh, teachers and other people who may uh, come into contact with young people to ensure that the training is adequate and that the support is appropriate. So, Presiding Officer, to conclude, I want to thank Gil Patterson again for bringing forward this important topic. 
It's an emotional topic, it's difficult, it's complex, but it requires us all to ensure that we do truly get it right for every child and recognise uh, the suffering and trauma that these young people are going through and the wider family, and that we also need to have and bring about a cultural change to be open about the way we deal with grief, to be open about the way we deal with death in Scotland. And we need to make sure that we use tonight, not just as a debate that we'll go home from and, and forget about, but use this debate as a platform by which we need to recognise the greater need to continue the support for charities and organisations that are helping people cope with uh, trauma and grief and suffering and pain, but also make sure that we work practically together to make sure that that dialogue is ongoing so that we recognise where challenges exist, we can work together to overcome them, to ensure that we are getting it right for every child, uh, and not just some children some of the time, but make sure that these children can go on and cope with that grief and cope with that trauma in a better way that doesn't diminish their long-term aspirations and hopes and fulfil their ambitions to uh, live um, uh, without having to suffer the pain that they have gone through. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.